So if you have to talk about the Jaiva and Jaiva is again, Jaiva waiver, you can get it even in cities because Jaiva waiver is either for rural areas or, or underserved areas within the city. Because where I come from, Lubbock, Texas, there is a big hospital and that is kind of an east part of town and that is underserved. So there are some cardiologists and some oncologists and some specialists who can get their Jaiva visas living in the city but working there until they get qualified and then they move on. So, so you have to just learn to identify those areas, which track you want to go, whether you want to go. And again, if you're a resident, then a, a resident means a US national resident. Then by the time you finish your residency, your, your challenge is going to be whether you want to go into your private practice or join a private practice, or you want to stay in academia and do research and teaching. So I'm going to do this you know, comparison for you. Back. And if you have any questions, it's an interactive I, I question, so just ask me any questions. You know, so whenever you decide, you have to look at yourself what you want. You know, most of the times people don't realize in this country you end up paying almost 50 to 60% of your income in taxes. So the main reason why people want to go in private practice is because they can make more money and that is mostly you can pay as your, your expenses. You can deduct those as a lot of expenses. Now, I want to look at these two sides like this. If you go into academia, there's a turnkey basis, you just walk it into a place, they already have everything set up for you. You don't have to start from scratch. You know, your paycheck starts to come right the first month and you're basically seeing patients and you're teaching and then you're also doing your research. But the, because I've been in practice for a long time and I have seen kind of downsides of that. The downside of that is that you're walking into a place which is turnkey basis, you start practicing the first day, everything is taken care of you. You don't know, most of the times those people who are in academia, they don't even know how much their department pays to shred paper. They don't know how much they are paying somebody to get rid of their shop and dispose of it. Okay, so they don't have. So the thing is, is that they, they are completely blinded on this side because the system is already set up and they just walked into the system. So, but, but the downside of that is, is that, you know, you cannot go, you can go up to a certain extent, you know, but if you want higher positions like professorship and research and teaching and you like it, then you have to assess yourself what kind of a person are you. Are you really wanting to make more money and be an entrepreneur on this side and use medicine as a springboard so that you can make money and go into other things and, 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 and start expanding your, your businesses and things like that? Or you want to stay in academia and be a teacher and be a researcher and write more, more papers and things like that. So I want you to compare. There's, there's tax benefits on both the, on, on the private practice side, plus there is other benefits on the academia side. So let's talk about just academia. So you can do, you can do like I said, research. The other thing some people like academia is because they get to teach residents. As a part of the attending, sometimes it's better for you because those attending you know, they don't end up seeing so many patients because mostly the fellows and the residents see the patient, they come and check out with you and you know the patient, so you just guide them and increase this, you know, increase this medicine, cut down this medicine, oh, this one is a side effect for this person, discontinue this medicine, change it to this one. So you're basically calling the shots, but you're not seeing, you do see patients, but you see much less as compared to private practice. Private practice, you have to see all your patients yourself. So this is, you know, so this is the other side. The other thing you see is on the academia side, sometimes there is a lot of politics within a department. And I have heard this from a lot of my, my colleagues who went into academia. They had a lot of problems with somebody pulling somebody like, you know, where there's two people, there's always going to be some politics. So you have, you know, a one, if, if, if one patient did not like you and he complained about you, they will open a peer review for it. Now the peer review, it will not be anything. You know, they will review it, your, your, your other friends and other faculty members will review the chart. They will tell you, oh, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that, you know, but everybody is different. So the thing is, you sometimes become a target of those peer reviews and things like that, okay? Which, which, which is you guys will not know right now. When you will get to that level, that becomes a big mess for you because then you're suddenly in the middle and then you think, okay, these people are gonna fire me and where are we gonna find the job? So suddenly, that, the guaranteed paycheck that you were looking at, you may not have it anymore. Okay? And sometimes there's a downside of that. If in one big city, if there are two or three big, big, big chains of hospitals, if you get peer reviewed at one visit, at one in one hospital, most of the times in the same city, you will have a hard time finding a job in the academy. Because then you'll have to just move to the city, find another program, you know, and look for something else. So, I have seen that happen to a lot of my colleagues who were in academia and they just had to leave the 
see if it's either they were peer reviewed or you know there was internal politics involved or something like that, which which obviously is a matter of stress that you have bills to pay and you you know so so that can add up on a lot of things. Now, but the good thing is you have everything taken care of. And at the end, when you retire, sometimes they will have a good retirement benefits, you know, most of the times. So that is one side of, of, of being in academia. Now let me just tell you a few things about the private practice. Now in private practice, you have to be a go-getter. Okay, go-getter means that you have to, there's two ways of getting into private. By the time you finish, either you can join a group, a private group, okay, which, is, which may be a, a single speciality group or a multiple speciality group, depends what kind of things you're looking for, where you want to situate yourself. So uh, what happens is, so when you're in the, in the, in the private sector, if you, either you join a group or you start the practice from scratch. Most of the times, those people who finish the residencies coming from any background, unless your dad is a millionaire and he can just put up a clinic for you and he can write all the checks and get you going, you look good, good luck to you. But most of the times, people don't have the resources. But the good thing is, if, if you're interested and you are a business-minded person, then the good thing is there are loans available that the, the bank will loan you money to start your own practice from scratch. But you need to have a loan. So first you have to find a location where you want to find it, you have to find an office place. It comes with a lot of cash, it comes with money. People do it. I, I still see people who have been in academia and they suddenly got sick and tired and they wanted to switch and went into you know, uh, private practice for themselves. And then they will be calling people who are already in private practice, please help me, you know, find out what is the, how do I do this, how do I hire a manager, how, where do I, uh, you know, get my shop's disposal, how can I cut down my cost, how can I do this, because you have to, it's just like you're running your own home. You want to cut down the cost and maximize the returns, how, where do I advertise, where do I go for, you know, to get more patients for my clinic. So then you will learn all those things from that side. But the good thing that that is, once it is, it is going to be an uphill battle for you. Okay, so you will learn how to run day-to-day -day operations, and you will learn how to save money, how to even just cut down even lunchtime. If there's nobody in the clinic, you will shut down the lights because you're paying for it. You know, in academia, you will not care. You will just walk out and insist on everything. So this is just like, there's pros and cons on both sides. But the good thing, and again, I can tell you on in, in private practices, is that you're your own boss. I don't get peer reviewed. If, I, if somebody gives me a bad review on my website, I can just, you know, either take it out or I can answer that so that for people to see. So I, I am on my own. The good thing is I, I decide my own hours. You know, if I want to just work from 8 till 4 and at 4.30 I want to go and be with my golf buddies, I can do that. You can't do that in anyway. You know, you can, you can stack more patients. You know, again, it depends how efficient your system is, how efficient you know how to work with the system how you would handle your business part. You know, there are some people who see 30 patients, 35 patients, even 40 patients, by three o'clock, 3.30, they're done. They have made their money, they have taken care of it, they have MAs, they have nurses who do the rest of the paperwork. You know, so you have to have the system set up, but it takes time to set up. But the good thing is that you know your own boss, like I said, you know, you, you call your own time. Whenever you want to take off to go to Pakistan, you can just, you know, you will have you know, some kind of a backup, another either private practice person who, you know, take care of your patients till you come back, or if you grow enough, you can have, you can hire in like nurse practitioners and, and uh, PAs who will help you see the patients and then you can give it up to them. You're always available on phone call or where they call you if there's decision making that needs to be done. I don't know what to do about this patient, so they'll call you and you can tell them. But the, but the benefit on this side is, is that first of all, nobody bosses you around, you have your own boss, you decide your own hours. And there's a lot of tax benefits. All these things that you do, you pay your rent, that is your deductible. You pay your electricity, that is your deductible. Uh -huh. if, uh, if, if you go and if you need, um, like, you know, again, you have to be just innovative about taking the tax benefits. You see, so then what you can do is, you know, if you go and let's say you go uh, to a conference, you come to Akna, you come to Logana, you can take that as your deductible. You know, because every expense, your airline ticket, your stay, your, your food, everything can be categorized. You just have to give that information to your CPA and he deducts for you on the, at the end of the year. So even the books that you buy, you pay on your own, you know, everything that you do, you do it on your own. But the good thing, like I said, is there's nobody boxing you around. And the good thing is you can practice for as long as you want. You know, you can decide, you know, I have some, some older physicians who are my mentors. You know, there's a person, he sees patients, he's an endocrinologist, he sees patients from only, he 
he because he, he's got to be designed himself. Ready. He gets up at like five o'clock in the morning. After five year prayer, he's at the clinic. He already has patients who want to see him before they go to work. So he sees patients from six to eight. You know, and his clinic is full. I mean, and I never realized that there was so much demand for a, for a time slot from six o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock. But if you go, I mean, he's got like 20 people or 18 people sitting in there. It's like, whoa. And they see that because before they go to work, they don't want to miss their work. They rather see you before you go to work. And he already does. He works from six to twelve, and then after twelve, his rest practitioner does it to the end. And he goes home. He goes home because his kids are gone. They are grown up. He doesn't need that much money. He wants to practice. He enjoys practicing. But then he has designed it. So this is it gives you in private practice. It gives you a lot of flexibility to to do things. Like that. And again, if you're smart enough, and you know, slowly, if you start in a place, you can rent a place. Then, when you start making money, then you can buy your own building instead of you know, instead of writing a check to someone else. If you buy your own building, then you're basically doing your own. You're paying your own mortgage, and in the end, you have a cash rent here. In the end of 15 years that you practice, you pay that building off. Now you own that building. Then you have to become more innovative about things. And like I said. You know, again, if you want to go into private practice, I mostly tell residents and younger physicians to use medicine as a springboard to get into other businesses. Then you can have mentors who will mentor you. If you want to get into real estate, you can do a lot of things. You can do a lot of things. So now, again, like I said, uh, so there's a lot of, like I said, this is a package deal. Okay? So you have to just decide which way you want to go. But the good thing I like is I like my peace of mind. You know, initially it is going to be hard, but again, you know, if you have already, what I see is, if you have already made it up to here working so hard, working a little bit extra when you have, you know, the time and the resources, is in my opinion a little bit better. So because I'm in my private practice, so I always tell people to do private practice. Because I, I do the same things. But again, what I miss is obviously, I, because I'm also part of faculty in this Texas Tech University, so I do actually get residents and nurse practitioners that I treat, but I'm basically in my private practice. I don't get any paycheck from those people. I just like to educate them and it's a part of like the academia of the faculty. So they send me residents, nurse practitioners, students, to shadow. So so I enjoy my little bit teaching there. I'm in the process of even starting uh, research uh, in my own clinic. Because then you can contact different pharmaceutical companies and they have different uh, different programs that they can book you up based on your specialty. And so they have products in the pipeline. <coughs> that they will be able to provide you those and you, they will even have someone and you get they will even have someone hired in your office who will do their paperwork they will pay you for that so you can do that too so then you get the mix of everything you're teaching you're doing your research but you're in private practice nobody bosses you around any any time you want to quit something you say bitch i want you guys to wrap up your stuff and take it away and i'm done with it so you know those are the pros and cons but the thing is you get to deduct a lot there's a lot of tax benefits any questions, guys? Because you, I know you guys are very early stage of this right now. You have to just go through this. But this is something to think what you have to do in the long run. You know, in the long run, if you want to get into academia, nothing wrong with that. I mean, I have a lot of friends who, who, who love academia. Well, uh, I'm just scared that you should try practice. You, you're alone handling all of the stuff. You what? You're alone handling all of the stuff. Right. What if, what if a patient feels that you're not getting for him and files? If you got the other things. Litigation and all that. Yeah. Then do no, litigation, or... remember, litigation, you can get sued in this country not just for practicing medicine, you can be, you can get sued even in a parking lot for practicing yeah. medicine. Okay. So, so I'll be honest with you, this is a very litigious society. But you see, the thing is, again, if you are nice, again, again, okay, being in academia, I don't want you to think that it's guaranteed. You know, they're academia, who also, but the, the only thing is academia, people have deeper pockets and better uh, lawyers. So they will just hush hush and they will do the settlement outside and they will get going. On this other side, you know, if you have high practice insurance, that also does the same thing. So, they, yeah. But you know, that, there is no guarantee. I don't want you to think that there is increased risk of you getting sued in the private practice versus uh, academia. Risk is the same. It does not matter. If you mess up a patient and you did not. Do the due diligence in taking care of it, and then after our, you know, you drew, let's say a patient comes in and, and you drew their labs and did the CK in uh, CK and uh, MB and you did the CH because they just complained of it. Now, when you get the call from them and they say, you know, he's dropping an and his CV and you're thinking he's going to an MI, 
you're supposed to call that patient and tell him, listen, I'm calling a, a cardiologist and you need to go to the emergency room right, right now. If you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you fail to do that and something happens to the patient, obviously, then you're in a dire risk of getting sued. But like I said, that can, you know, so getting sued does not matter whether you're a private practice or you are in academia. You can get sued all. You know, even in academia and the hospitals, patients fall all the time. Their, their families can sue you for their loved ones all the time. Okay. So I don't want you to think that it is increased risk. There's no increased risk. Yeah. The thing is, you just have to know, we can conduct yourself in a professional manner all the time. Whether you're practicing in academia or whether you're practicing in a respective environment. Any other questions, guys? Now, this is good, good, very good advice that Sarma is giving you. So, um, it may not be, it may not seem relevant right now, yes. but when you're in your second or third year of residency, that may become more relevant at that time. Right. So, how do you start planning? I mean, you're in residency, you're in an academic institution, you don't see yourself in a private practice setting. So, how do you start planning as soon as I'm done with my residency or fellowship? How do you make that jump? How do you? Yeah, it all, it honestly, it all, in the end, it all depends on two things. The first thing is your own, your own, uh, what I call, your own goals in life. If your goal in this life is to have a, a big CV where you have done written so many papers and you want to teach, you know, you have to assess yourself. If you are a material that is ready for this and you're primed for this, go ahead and, and, and do that. I'm not saying not. But if you're a person who's going to be an entrepreneur, who's going to use medicine and be able to honestly make more money and be able to have more, you know, for yourself, then you need to look at the practices. In, in the end, it all comes down to what you want, number one. Number two, it depends on your resources. Because by the time you finish the residency, by the time you finish your fellowship, you're not going to have deep enough pockets to be able to go into a private practice for yourself. So another one, one step that sometimes some people do is they will join a private group. They will join a multi-speciality or single speciality group and they will stay with them for like two, three years. And there's two ways of doing that. Either you can be, you can share the overhead cost with them, then you become, you have enough, enough of big space. And they say, okay, we have these four exam rooms, a nurse station will give you this, you pay us so much rent. And then and we'll help you get your billing and collection and everything else done. So you are already coming into a structure where you don't have to do anything. It's again, you're in the private sector, but they're already established everything. You just come in, start seeing your patients, start developing your practice. Now, on the other side, the problem is not to resources, how much money you have. Because once you go into private practice, I tell most of the people that expect to have at least six to eight months of living expenses on the side because it will take your time. You will start making money the first day, but normally billing cycle, how it works is 45 days. So even if you start seeing patients and you start your practice from scratch, you know, you will not be able to pay your bills right away. You need six to eight months of living expenses test aside, and then slowly your you money will start to come in and then you'll start to, you, you're going to level yourself. So it all depends on the hard deeper problems you have. So you can go into a private group. Some people do that. They stay there for a little bit, learn the tricks of private practice, how to structure and how to do everything. And then they say, they sign a lease with them for two to three years, you know, four years, five years, whatever develop enough cash flow on the side. So then you say, I'm going to, and that gives you time to learn, and then you can do your own research, find an office space, find what kind of practice you want to do, where the location, you know, who's going to send you the patients, and then you can just slowly transition. When your lease is done with these people, then you can get your own practice, you can start your, you know, it takes time, it's not easy, but you know, there's ways of doing it nowadays. You know, you don't have to buy brand new furniture for everything, you can buy on eBay, you don't have to buy everything, you know, like I said, I do when I from a private practice. I sometimes buy stuff on eBay, which is like we use. It just gets shipped to me, I know what I want. So instead of spending $450, I can buy something which is only $40. So you see, you become more innovative. You start to learn how to do things. You are getting the same thing, but you're not paying a full price to a vendor who's going to come and underwrite this for you. You can have someone, you know, deliver that to you. So like I said, but it is easy, it's not, it's not difficult. The only thing you have to do is what you want in life. That is the most important thing that you have to do. Do you want you know, big papers with your name, you want keys, you want the package with that is, that remember about the politics, remember about being able to switch your jobs, remember about something happening to your reputation as a physician, not being able to practice in the same city, you have to move. 
Whereas on this other side, you know, you are your own boss, nobody is bossing you around, you decide your own hours, you have more tax benefits, you can grow more, you can you can hire you know three nurse practitioners. Like I have two nurse practitioners who work for me. Apart from me seeing patients, they are seeing patients for me. So how we look at it in private practice as long as they see enough patients that they can generate their own pay, I'm happy with it. Even plus if I don't make money. Plus or <laughs> no, plus overhead, yeah, because it is calculated for them. You see, but what we do is we, we, we you know, in, in every business model, we actually know that if you see so many patients and these are the kind of patient mix that you see, what will be your reimbursement, what your reimbursement will be, and what is what we call break even point. So for a nurse practitioner, normally now my break even point is between 18 to 20 patients. If my nurse practitioner is seeing 18 to 20 patients a day, for five days a week, she's generating her revenue. Now, if she starts to see more, then you can again, you can be innovative. That's many other things here. Then what you do is, you tell them, okay, we, I'm going to give you a, a production bonus in a sliding scale. So if you make me $20,000, I'll give you $2,000. You make me $40,000, I'll give you $4,000. So what that, what that does is it entices that person to work hard, to also become part of your team and not just sit there and wait. They will try to go out and get more patients. They will go to their church and recruit more patients. They will go to different places to recruit more patients for themselves. So then instead of seeing just 18 to 20 patients where she's breaking in, she may be seeing as much as yours. You know, she may be seeing 30 patients. And then at the end of the quarter, you're going to have to write her a check because it's all calculated in the form of reports that get generated. So we can tell how much they have produced, how much so they look at them. This is how much you made money. This is your bonus check. So you see, there are different ways of enticing people into becoming more and more. And that's the beauty of the system is that you know you can you can entice people, you can encourage them. Everybody is a winner. People don't mind to take an extra two or three thousand dollars every, you know, every month because that is extra money you can use for the future. Does that does that make yes, sense? Yes, yes, it does. Do you need to sign your restitution also? Your private Yes, yes, yes. Again, remember, again, I'll meet you. You see, again, how it works is you have to be more efficient. You see, what I do if you shadow me and what my normal is is because I already have established practice. So if you will, if I see many patients. So I have a lot of MAs, I have a lot of nursing staff, ancillary staff. So what happens, they just check in the patient for me. I just go in and what I like is I like all their medicines out like this. I don't want a list. Because I want to see what my patient is taking, when did they last fill their medicines. You know, if I'm if I'm talking to them and a patient is on an ACE inhibitor and he's triggering some dry cough, I'm gonna change it to an ARB. So I want to see, okay, this one does only four pills left. So I'll say, just go ahead and discontinue, I'm gonna give you a so my business model is I, I go in, I greet the patient, I shake hands, I say, how are you doing? As soon as I start, I just start to look at your medicine. So how is your diabetes? You know, what is your high blood sugar running? Did you have any symptoms of hypoglycemia? I'm just giving you this right now. So you see what I do, I do my assessment, but then I have my MA who is also my uh, scribe. Okay. So, so I sign in first, I open the computer, I open sign in, patient's chart is there, and then before even I go in, I have reviewed their last, the last lab. So if last lab, the A1C was nine, and the patient is only on metformin 500, so I said, hey, I know I'm gonna bump that up to there. So anyway, so when you go in, basically, I do the assessment part, but I have a scriber who will do the things for me. So like that, I can talk to the patient directly, I'm not like doing this constantly. But if I'm talking to you, I'm looking in your eyes. I'm talking, talking to my patient. If he says, hey, it hurts here, I'm gonna examine the patient hands on. What is going on? Let's move this. Let's see this. You know, get up on the exam table. I'm going to examine it. So my, while I'm talking to my patient, this is what I'm doing. Okay, how's been your blood pressure? Do you check your blood pressure or not? Okay, how's your depression? Are you feeling more down and depressed? You're not homicidal, you're not suicidal. Is this Alexa working good for you? You see, so for a good practice, you, you just, you let it develops over years and you have to know your patients. So I just do that and then by the time I get done, I ask them, is there anything else that we have not discussed? They say, no, we have discussed everything, okay. So we decided we're gonna go up on your metformin and you know, you're still a little bit depressed and you're on 10 milligrams of exam, I'm gonna bump it up to 20. So what I do is now in my note, I have a dicta form. So what I do is I'm gonna dictate my assessment and plan. I'm gonna just say increase metformin to 1,000 milligrams, BID, increase of exam to milligrams due day, uh, RTC return to clinic in two months. So what does that mean now my scriber, because I trained her, she will give the patient enough medicine. So she's going to prescribe for metformin thousand number sixty with mm -hmm. one refill, and then she will increase the selexa to twenty. Yeah. Okay. By the time, and I don't do this stuff. 
you see, Prada factor, that's what I like is, I'll hire people who do this for me. Mm -hmm. I just go in, do my assessment, my plan, I see patients, you know, go, you know, schedule patient for dietary eye exam, my nurse practitioner will call my ophthalmologist, get him an appointment for his dietary eye exam, she's going to find out from him which pharmacy, and mostly we have very well organized. Before when patient checks in, we know which pharmacy they use. So she will just do the EMR, she will send the prescriptions and then I go and talk to the next patient. So my question is how uh, how has um, urgent care or retail clinics and all of these new setups, how has that affected your private practice? Are you getting less patients because of that? No, 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 no. it's not affecting us at all actually. No. And, and some of actually, you see again, you are going to see a downtrend because in this country what happens, uh, people sometimes find a niche to make more money. Mm -hmm. How this urgent care and yes. corners, uh, corners yeah. ER, ER scan exactly. is because of the reimbursement. Because if they will make a CT scan and have they, they provide everything under one roof, it may be a small place. There's no trauma surgeon there. There's just an ER physician or even a family practice or internal medicine that yeah. working there. So what they do is they, they, what they did initially, they tried to capture that market where the insurance companies were going to pay them a lot of money. So if you go in even to get your strep test, you know, you will yeah. get a bill for like hundred dollars. You're like, strip this for hundred dollars. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. You see, but they were they were doing is they were capturing that they were using ER status for, for the insurance companies to get reimbursed at a much bigger rate. But recently, actually, it has caught up with it. You see, a lot of a lot of ERs and a lot of uh, ERs, I especially not the urgent care. Okay. Urgent care is still okay, but a lot of those corner stone. I mean, what I call ERs, yeah. they are shutting down and they are just liquidating is because they cannot make money. Insurance companies have, you know, have caught up with that. They are not reimbursing it, but they have a big system. They have a CAT scan, they have an AER. So you see, so you cannot do that. But people do that only, but to, uh, as a private practice, yeah. it's mostly your patients, if you're open, I again, you have to take, teach them. I tell my patients and I have what we call is a rotating schedule. Okay. So what I do is, if my schedule, if I have 40 patients, I see, I can accommodate five or six my walk-in, what we call walk-in patients, yeah. which are my own. So if, if somebody comes in and says, you know, Dr. Mahal, I just got cough congestion. You're already my patient. I don't, I don't need to do detailed history or anything else. Mm -hmm. I'll just look their throat, check their ears, you know, listen to their chest, tell my nurse, go ahead and call in a mouth for this. You know, if you're wheezing, I'm going to call in a dinner for you. You know, it's really easy when you do this all the time. But the patient you're not losing patients because of no. all these. Okay. Because again, yeah. we went beyond the, the, yeah. And eventually they're supposed to come back to the primary care either. For follow up. Okay. Yeah. So if they get seen there after hours, they will tell them to come and follow up. Okay. And their home okay. clinics have so much time. Exactly. Exactly. But again, but sometimes what happens is the primary care physicians, they are sometimes so busy that they don't have a rotating schedule or they don't have nurse practitioners. Yeah. So they will not be able to accommodate patients in a timely fashion. If you cannot accommodate your patient in a timely fashion, obviously the patient is going to go somewhere else because the patient needs to be seen. So this is why having nurse practitioners is better because, when, like I said, my complicated patients, even I, if I ever see them, my nurse practitioners see them. Like I said, I have a, you know, a person with you know, 10 comorbid conditions and she just has a UTI. She just comes in, my nurses already know, they will get a UA done. Before even I see the patient or my nurse sees the patient, we will have a UA. So if you know, if I see that because I tested nitrate is positive, I'm going to go ahead and treat her. I'm just going to be, so I don't sometimes, I just don't even open the chart. Mm -hmm. I will just tell my nurse, okay, you know, do a nurse visit. If I'm busy, you know, depends if you're seeing 50, 60 patients, the whole waiting room is full, you cannot spend that much time. So I tell them just do a nurse visit. I assess the patient, patient has a UTI, just call him back to PS twice a day for three days, you're done. You see, so the main thing is if you will accommodate and the whole idea of private practices is to capture your own patients and provide them everything under one roof. Yeah. If you will give them, they will never go anywhere. So do you did you have a call on call system on Saturdays and Sundays? Yes, yes. We have a we have a system where again you're required by law actually to have. Okay. Yes. So you have a system where somebody takes a call and they do a triage on the phone. Uh -huh. You see on the triage, one of the, the messages that you will uh, hear is if it is emergency, please call 911 yeah. because we can't help you. But if it is something that you need to contact about a nurse, then there's a menu that you press one, two, three, and you can talk to the person, leave it, and then we will call you back. Well, that, that's a nurse. There's a nurse for that. There's a nurse, yes. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. There's a nurse for that. So you have to just set up the whole system. Once yeah. you set it up, it just runs on cruise control. After that, you just have to fine tune a little bit up and down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.